up on Mornings on the Hill, the presidential election is steadily approaching, and today, SU organizations brought registration to the students. And there's now an easier way to contact academic counselors for Maxwell and arts and science students. We have your latest COVID-19 update nationally and right here on campus. And Onondaga County is running out of money. Early voting and COVID guidelines are stretching the county's resources with no state support. Good morning, I'm Rob Flax. And I'm Sarah Alsheh. Thank you for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. Our top story, we're 40 days out from election day and voting registration deadlines are approaching from many states, but on campus, SU students don't have to go far to register. To sit back and not vote is impossible. Daisy Leapson is taking advantage of the voting registration drive set up on the quad this week. SU organizations teamed up to provide voter registration and absentee ballot forms for students wanting to vote in this year's election. Leapson says this is one of the most important presidential elections of our time, and voting is a must. Every vote does count, in my opinion. It really does matter, and it's really just about making sure you're as involved as you can. Polami Das is an SU student volunteering with the voting drive. She says all a student has to bring to the drive is themselves. All you have to do is just come to the booth, fill out the information, and we can even mail it for you so we, it's all done. Polami says registering to vote takes just as long as going to the bathroom or snapping a quick selfie, but that short amount of time can make all the difference. One decision every four years can almost kind of set the next 50 years of politics into place. And whether you're sending an absentee ballot or heading to the polls, Palami is telling everyone, Don't forget to vote. Don't forget to go out and vote. Today, you can register to vote on the SU Quad from 10 to 3 in Tent B. The Maxwell School and the College of Arts and Sciences are launching a, launching a new texting program to strengthen communications between students and their advisors. Maxwell Assistant Dean Steve Schaffling says the service is more than just a push notification. Put it this way, if, if nothing else, students get swamped in email, right? And, and we have a very limited, two things. We have a very limited, like, outgoing text messaging plan that surrounds basically the whole, the hello message, <laughs> particular deadlines, like ad drop, course withdrawal. And it's really about inbound stuff from students right that we so that if they send us a message with a question that we that's simple we can answer it or we can say hey that's a great question we should sit down and talk about it students can opt out of the tech service if they want to and still meet in person with advisors but this kind of communications is only available to arts and science and maxwell students the United States reached a grim milestone yesterday with 200,000 COVID-related deaths. Confirmed cases are set to reach 7 million in the next few days. Here on campus, current active cases have spiked slightly over the past week. There are 31 active student cases in the Syracuse area and 105 students in quarantine. After three students tested positive on the eighth floor of Day Hall late last week, mandatory retesting of residents in the building resulted in no other positives. South Campus residents were informed via email last night that they all must be tested for COVID today. The tests will be conducted at Sky Barn from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's just over a month away, but with concerns over the COVID-19 pandemic, some people say going to the ballot box is a risk they just can't afford to take. It's just 33 days until votes will be cast for the next president of the United States. Officials at the Onondaga Board of Elections say most votes will be cast from home. Our estimate is 125,000 uh, out of uh, uh, 200 or, or 300,000 voters. Despite the low numbers, there's a New York state mandate forcing in-person voting to be available. To make sure everyone is safe, the county has had to do more to prepare. We provide PPE for our inspectors. Uh, we also have masks and we'll be enforcing the mask rule and we'll be having sanitary supplies there along with our extra inspectors to make sure that after every use, we are, are, are cleaning the equipment. Sarni told me that the funds used 
to help us prevent the spread of COVID-19 are old grant funds provided by New York State to help with new elections equipment. Some other counties just do not have that surplus money and are going to be in a lot of trouble. So we're going to feel this budget hit. Um, and we look around our host county, there, there's layoffs going on. So we're trying to save as much money as possible from the local dollars. Despite the risks, some voters believe the county is doing enough to ensure everyone's safety, even for early voting. Just uh, I've heard a lot on the news about voting by mail and delays in the USPS and all of that. So I just figured, you know, as long as I wear a mask, take the necessary precautions, voting in person seems yeah, like absolutely. the better bet. I mean, I definitely would rather have my vote count than not count. And if having a mail-in ballot would decrease the risk or decrease the chance of it actually counting, then I definitely want to have my vote count in person. Absentee ballots are already available online at the BOE website. If you would like to vote in person, early voting begins on October 24th. For NCC News, I'm Ryan Clark. Syracuse released a new survey to students this week meant to help the university gauge the current campus climate, student responses, and Syracuse in creating a diverse and inclusive community. Students are asked direct questions and are able to fill in free-form answers on their experiences and thoughts. The survey is available until October 30th. With just under a month of gyms being open in New York, operations for both owners and members are returning closer to normal. Members are resuming their training and gyms are facing strict guidelines to keep them safe. Hercules Gym in Manly is opened on August 24th, the first day of gym reopening. Owner Pete Knutson said he had just one week between the release of the New York safety guidelines and his opening day to get ready. Install exhaust fans that take the air out of this place. And it's, it was, it was kind of hectic because, you know, you have all this time we were closed. We were closed for five months. It was kind of like a mad scramble where you're kind of like, you know, it would have been helpful to have these guidelines a little beforehand. People in the building at once, but with a 1,200 square foot facility, Cutson said even at peak times there were no more than 30. He says he wishes those guidelines that kept him closed for months were more flexible. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, the Syracuse community remembers Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the powerful vigils in Washington, D.C., and right here on campus. Taking a live look at New House 3 this morning, it's breezy, hovering in the low 60 degrees. Coming up, I'm going to have your full five-day forecast, so you better stick around with Mornings on the Hill. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. Time to check on hey, your guys, weather for today. Sierra is live outside to tell us what to expect. Sierra, you jumped in a little early. What can you tell us now? I can't really give you the cue hand. Okay. Go. Hey, Rob. Well, it is officially fall, but the weather isn't exactly matching this season. Temperatures are heating up into the weekend. So let's take a look at that. Looking at the weather right now, it looks relatively quiet compared to yesterday, but there are some clouds in the sky and Today it's still just about 60 degrees, brighter skies this afternoon, and it'll peak into the low 70s, but you're still going to feel that breeze. Tomorrow it's looking similar, partially sunny skies and starting your day off in the 50s, and that's going to slowly increase to a 70 degree high in the afternoon. And finally, let's look at that rest of the five day forecast. Temperatures are really heating up. I mean, look at Saturday, we're going to see a high of 81 degrees, so it could be a nice weekend for some outdoor plans. Thursday and Friday are looking nice as well with lows in the 50s and highs in the 70s. Sunday, we are on a bit of a storm watch. There's going to be some rain with potential for lightning heading your way. But the lightning and rain shouldn't come until later in the day Sunday, so you will have time to get those last weekend plans in. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm from California, so I'm definitely going to be soaking up that 81 degree weather this weekend. Back to you in the studio. President Trump announcing yesterday that the plans to reveal his pick to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's Supreme Court seat this Saturday. Mornings on the Hill reporter Ford Hatchett looks back on the legal legacy the woman affectionately dubbed RBG left behind. Anyone fortunate enough to watch Ruth Bader Ginsburg work was in awe at her legal prowess. Take it from 2020 SU Law graduate Natalie Mayer, who visited the Supreme Court last summer. And I swear when Justice Ginsburg walked out and took her seat, everyone in that court kind of sat up like a little bit straighter. Mayer grew up in Syracuse and was the president of the Woman Law Students Association at SU. She recently began work as a clerk in New Jersey's Superior Court and says 2020 law school grads navigating a pandemic-affected job market draw strength from Ginsburg's experience after graduating from the top of her class at Columbia. And yet 
not a single firm in Manhattan was willing to hire her because she was a woman and a mother. Ginsburg spent her undergrad years at Cornell, where Cornell law professor Cynthia Grant Bowman says Ginsburg prepared to become a crucial figure in feminist judicial theory. We stand on the shoulders of those before us, and certainly her shoulders, though she was a tiny, tiny woman, were very broad. Ginsburg's crusade against gender discrimination actually began in the 1970s, when she took on cases that featured discrimination against men. At the time, the courts that she was going before as a lawyer were benches of all men. And in order to get them to pay attention, she had to bring before them a problem that applied to someone who looked like them. And Mayer says even if she had never sat on the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have achieved legendary status. The decades of case law, tens of cases of gender inequality, and those are law. And they have been law now for a long time and hopefully will remain law. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Ford Hatchett. I drove down to D.C. on Sunday to attend the vigil that paid respects to the life and legacy of Ruth Ginsburg. And just being there around women and men and children and them sharing their stories about where they were when she was first sworn in, it was such an emotional experience to be a part of. And in just two days, there were so many signs, handmade drawings and paintings for her. And you could really show it really showed just how much people truly loved her from just people coming from far in near states just to be at the vigil and this friday she'll be the first woman in state to lie in the u.s capitol thank you back to you in the studio syracuse and new york city based spin car company is announcing its annual charity golf tournament that was held on saturday at the foxfire golf course the event was put together in just five weeks and as more activities resume amidst the pandemic when it was all over, more than 85 golfers had participated to help the Boys and Girls Club of America, raising over $4,000. Yeah, we weren't really sure if we were going to have a golf tournament whatsoever, but as things slowly opened up, we decided since it's outdoors, we felt safe doing this. We got a team together with a bunch of my friends and, uh, you know, just out here for a good cause. You know, kind of joking around. It's good to get out with, with, with friends and you know, co-workers and have, you know, have a good time with people that outside of work. Coming up after the break, SU football was on the road again this weekend, coming back home with another loss against Pitt and to look into how SU's club tennis team is serving up this season. Syracuse fans will have their first chance at watching Orange football under the brand new dome roof. Phase one of the $118 million renovation is officially complete as SU welcomes its Saturday opponent, Georgia Tech. The new dome not only features a new roof, but it also has a center hung scoreboard. Fans will not be in attendance, but the game will be broadcasted on the Fox Sports Go app through the ACC Regional Sports Network. It was another rough week for SU football. Josh Miller has more on what went wrong. Syracuse football suffered their second straight loss of the season this past Saturday against Pitt. Offensively, the Orange continued to struggle, but the defense held their own. Picking up action in the first quarter, Pitt quarterback Kenny Pickett drops back and finds Jordan Addison for the score. Pitt up four going into the second quarter. Stephon Thompson, the freshman linebacker around the edge, sacks Pickett. This Syracuse defense again played great for the second week in a row. Rex Culpepper in the game now. Starting quarterback Tommy DeVito was shaken up on a sack the play before, but no worries for the redshirt senior. Culpepper finds Taj Harris for the 69-yard touchdown bomb, the first touchdown of the season for the Orange. Great story with this one. Culpepper battling cancer two years ago, defeats the cancer, and now he's throwing dimes. Can't help but root for the man. Syracuse with a 10-7 lead now, but that would not hold. Kenny Pickett punches it in from one yard out, and the Panthers now a 14-10. Syracuse driving with some momentum and it's put to a stop by Paris Ford. The screen pass intercepted and it's the Panthers going the other way. Pitt started the runaway with this one. Pickett drops back, finds Jared Wayne for the touchdown. That would do it with the final Pitt 21, Syracuse 10. Here's head coach Dino Babers after the loss. That if we can get something going on offense and special teams, that we're going to have a defense that we can really be proud of when the smoke all clears. But uh, obviously we've got to make some changes and we've got to start getting that ball moving in the right direction. The last time a Syracuse football team started the season 0-2 was back in 2013. That team finished with a winning season and a bowl game victory. 
The Orange look to flip the switch this Saturday as they take on Georgia Tech at noon. Josh Miller, Mornings on the Hill. The Los Angeles Lakers took a 2-0 series lead into Tuesday night, but with their backs against the wall, the Denver Nuggets saw it as a must-win game. First half was marked by the Nuggets' hustle. Jamal, Mil Jamal Murray follows his own miss, and a few passes later, Jeremy Grant in the corner, three of his 26 points. And then it's Murray running the transition offense. Michael Porter Jr. knock it down. Denver couldn't miss in the first half. Nikola Jokic here over Anthony Davis, one of the best defenders in the association. Nuggets lead by double digits into the half. The Los Angeles fights back off a of Grant miss. It's Danny Green finding Contavious Caldwell Pope for the transition three. And on the very next play, KCP strips Grant and takes it the coast. Lakers pull back within five. But Denver wasn't done yet. The former Syracuse star, Jeremy Grant here on this play with the runner over LeBron James, gets the pass from the corner and drives it in, puts the Nuggets back up by five. And then Jamal Murray, who made himself a superstar in the bubble this summer, hits the dagger over Anthony Davis. Nuggets with the big game three win. Final score, Denver 114, Los Angeles 106. The three Lakers, big men, Anthony Davis, JaVel McGee, and Dwight Howard just had four combined rebounds. Meanwhile, Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic both had double doubles. Jeremy Grant's 26 points served as crucial Game four will be played on Thursday at 9. Game four of the Celtics and Heat is tonight at 8.30. Select club sports have begun practicing. Steven Shoemaker took it to the courts to give us an update on club tennis here at Syracuse. Syracuse University has over 40 club sports teams. As sports are slowly but surely starting to make their way back onto campus, club sports are as well. Not every club sport has gotten the green light to start practicing due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. One sport that has started practicing is men's and women's club tennis. Tennis is a sport where being distant and spaced out just naturally comes with the sport. Whether you're playing singles or doubles, you're always going to be at least six feet apart from your teammate or opponent. Everybody has to wear a mask at all times, um, on and off the court, um, when you're playing, going to get water and whatnot. And then everybody has to stay six feet apart as much as possible. And our equipment and whatnot, it has to be spaced out by six feet as well. Obviously, we're working at limited capacity, which means that for our new tryouts, we could only take a certain number, um, just because we don't want to go over capacity in terms of how many people are on the court, because um, there's often people from the public playing here too, so we want to just keep everybody on the university safe. It's nice to see that club sports are slowly but surely starting to make their way back onto Syracuse's campus. You can feel that cold weather is right around the corner, so when it becomes too cold out for club tennis to be able to play at the Sky Top Tennis Courts located on South Campus, they'll move indoors to Drumlin's Country Club. Reporting live for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Steven Shoemaker. Here on Mornings on the Hill, what are tattoo shops doing to make sure you don't get COVID while you get ink? This story and more coming up. Welcome back. Many college students take up a job during their school year, but one now new house student is making money in a way you might not expect. James Corgan has the details on this twist on working from home. Zeeland Shannon comes home from class at Newhouse. He does what many college students do. He prepares his workspace, clocks in, puts on his uniform, and goes to work. Read with the five gifted subs. Except Zeeland is a video game streamer playing in front of a virtual audience on the website Twitch. There's certainly a stigma that I'm sitting in my mom's basement. But for Zeeland, this is more than just a hobby. In August, I made $5,000. He makes this money playing Football Manager, a global soccer simulation game. His subscribers on Twitch pay to be a part of his community. If you're ever having a bad day, you got a lot of people in your corner. Making more money than the average American family while streaming video games on the side sounds like every college student's dream. But as Shannon tells me, making your living through a computer screen is not all fun and games. It happens in spurts. And so you doubt yourself in the, uh, you don't believe you're gonna hit the next spurt. Streaming is not Zeeland's only passion. He is a play-by-play -play announcer at the University of Virginia, his alma mater, and is pursuing it further as a master's student at Newhouse. I'm willing to spend any amount of money and willing to do anything in order to get the stream to work while I'm doing the play-by-play. -play. 
Whether it be in sports or streaming, Zeeland Shannon always has his eye on the goal. James Cargan, Mornings on the Hill. Many businesses are still recovering from their COVID-19 closures, but Samantha Croston shares how the pandemic increased business for one local shop close to campus. Samantha? Many of the businesses on Marshall Street have been negatively impacted since COVID-19 began. Some have even permanently shut down. But for Halo's tattoo and piercing shop, ever since the pandemic began, business has actually been booming. Take a look. Halo Tattoo Shop manager DJ Rosedna says that in a time when many people are suffering from immense sadness and loss, they turn to tattoos for a dopamine release. I think that tattoos are a way that people have found to express themselves spiritually and psychologically and uh, get, a, get a big return on their investment. Normally in periods of depression, people turn to bars and entertainment as escapes, <laughs> but those are not options in the pandemic. Rosetta says that tattoos are an alternative that people choose because of its permanence. I think that as far as tattooing, like they're actually buying something that's not going to wear out and they're not going to throw it away. I think that's why people sometimes celebrate with tattoos because they're like, yeah, this is a one time purchase and I get to have this forever. The tattoo shop has continued to bring in business, but there are some rules inside of the store that have changed due to COVID-19. Lip tattoos and oral piercings aren't allowed. And if you do decide you want to have a tattoo or a piercing, you have to go alone. And we'll have people come up together and we'll say, you know, like, oh, we thought this. And I'm like, well, sorry. And they're like, well, we got to wait. And I'm like, anywhere but in here, especially students. You know, students, we, we like to have students come in with friends, but now is not the time. Even though Rosetta had some trouble adjusting customers to new rules, he says tattooing people during a pandemic has been extremely rewarding. I've tattooed all people that were employed and really busted their butts when, uh, when, when the going got tough. And now they're here to, to spend a little and celebrate that they did that. That makes me happy. Now, Rosenda did say that he had to shut down his store for three months during the pandemic. However, he was able to hire back all of his employees besides one. When I asked him how he got through the difficult time, he said that he remained positive and he really tried to only focus on things that he knew were within his control. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Sam. The first major award show amidst the coronavirus occurred on Sunday and it was not what we were used to. CR Rider joins us in studio with the top news from the 72nd Emmy Awards. That's right. Well, Jimmy Kimmel hosted what was, and it was just not the normal occurrence. There was no audience, stars were accepting from their homes, and that was not even the top news. I have two words for you, and that is Schitt's Creek. The Canadian comedy swept every single major comedy category this year. It was the show's last and final season to be accoladed, and they sure did bring home the gold. And in the drama categories, it was HBO original Succession scoring the top drama award. Zendaya was also a surprise winner as best actress for her work in Euphoria. She also made history with the win, the youngest to win best actress in a drama at 24 years old. And for a limited series, Watchmen scored big, Regina King taking best actress for her work in that as well. And well, I was able to speak with some SU Emmys fans here on campus and they were really excited about the night's big winners. I think that she's made such an incredible transition from a Disney Channel star to like a mainstream, really successful actress. And so it'll definitely, definitely be on my list of shows to watch after. Yeah. I'm so happy that Schitt's <laughs> Creek won because it's their last season. It was their last chance to kind of show their acting chops in this realm. I'm excited to see what they go off and do. But it was really exciting for them to kind of snag that win in 